Hello and welcome back to Outdoor Asylum. Been a while since we podcast. Uh, I've got David St. John here with me. What's up, man? Uh, not much. Not much. We got a special guest too. We got little Hector with us. Oh, Hector. Yeah, I couldn't resist the other day. I had to buy a toy. I'm like a, I'm just like a little kid, and I'm a big fan of the show. And we found out there's a lot of people that don't know who this is. But for any of you that watch Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul, which was the spinoff, you know they had. Uh, had Hector Salamanca, who was the big um, one of the cartel bosses, you know that that ran this uh, this family, and he had a stroke during the uh, during the show and became uh, he was in a wheelchair and and dependent on oxygen, so he's got the oxygen cannula in, and he's always got a mad look on his face. He's using oxygen and in communicate. He couldn't speak, so they got him this little bell <laughs> that sits on the wheelchair. And, you know, like, yes, there's one ding on the on there, and, you know, and they, they might show him something, put the alphabet up there, and he hits a ding when they hit the right letter so he can spell out what he wants to say. But the show's funny because he knows of a conspiracy that's going on, but he can't communicate it. He's always angry. And I, I just – I think he's cool. And this is – Hector is me – when, uh, you know, I've always said, I, like, I don't have a big portfolio. Retirement's not really something I'm looking for. I don't know when when I'll be able to retire. It's kind of like the old joke. I'll have to I'll have to work half a day on the day of my funeral. You know, I'm, I don't have the, I don't have a big retirement plan. So my goal in life is to be up here wheeling around the elite duck call shop like Hector here with an oxygen tank, uh, just watching everything and dinging the little bell at Braden and Jake and all, you know, the – the younger guys that are here, so I'm going to pour gravel in the hallways so you can't get down. So, <laughs> man, that's just cold. It's like I, maybe I take my bell and report you to you know for like elder abuse or something like that if I can get in front of the right part. Give us the, give us a bell. So when Hector Hector likes something or if he will say yes, let's let's hear the bell. This is, I mean, how do you beat it? I when I saw this thing, I had to have it. We got to have a new mascot, so I had to have Hector. That's one yes. That's one yes. <laughs> That's an emergency. That's, That's what I'm going to be doing. You put gravel out there in that hallway. But About every uh, foot. <laughs> you know, it's no fun. We get to come in here and play with stuff like this. we got Braden out there working right now. He's out there. And if you hear some hum in the background, that's the machines running or the compressor kicking on. With uh, we got Braden out there working feverishly, and we're in here just having fun. That's like I told Jake. It's this WIP, man. Work yeah. in progress. Work in progress. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, so – We'll give you the Hector test here one more time. So one of the proposals, one of the things we wanted to talk about was they are proposing to bring back in Arkansas spinning wing decoys um, on public ground. So yeah. with Hector, uh, one ding is a is a yes, and then nothing is a no. So would, would Hector ring the bell for that? Sounds like a no to me. Yeah, Jake's booing. The producer, Jake, say he's booing in the background. And I, th- I think I agree with that. So we're not really in favor of it. If they're going to vote on it, we're telling the Arkansas Game and Fish what we would like. We would like to go ahead and keep the spinning wing decoys banned. Banned everywhere, Okay. in my opinion. Okay. If they're going to ban it, ban it all. Okay. If they're, if they're not going to ban it, then open it up to everybody. All right. So now That's me. Me. It's, it's banned on the public, but private – is you can use whatever on pi- on private ground. Right. So, I think the proposal is not to. It has nothing to do with private. I think it's no. just on public. Yeah, just letting them take it back to public ground. Yeah. So, we're all we're all shaking our head no that we really don't want to see this. Um, so why why would you be against it? I don't. I didn't like it when it first came out, although it was pretty awesome <laughs> to watch, you know, the reaction of the Ducks, you know, f- from cloud level, from what we call stratosphere, mm-hmm. you know, not even have to pick a duck call up and just watch them respond, you know. But there comes that point that, I, you know, they use them up north, way north of us, Canada, whatnot. Uh, and... I think it's depleted mm-hmm. some, you know, some of the migration that happens coming down here. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good point. I mean, let's talk about the evolution of it for a second. Cause I, I was thinking about that this morning when I was thinking about this podcast and 
and actually think about what the game and fish was were proposing here. And man, I remember like man when those things first came out. First of all, I saw I saw a potential for uh, spinning wing before spinning wing came out. What year was it that we saw? Or roughly when was it? I was thinking it was like ninety nine ish, ninety nine two thousand something like that two thousand one okay. maybe. Okay, I was thinking earlier, but it might it might have been around that time. But I actually remember whenever it came out, 1988 was the first time I ever went to Stuttgart. Saw my first duck calling competition, saw the festival down there. And there was a guy that was selling, um, it was a spinning wing thing. What the, what these were, it was, a, um, it was a, a, a rubber thing that would strap on the back of a decoy. So he would have like the old, I remember he had them on the old flambeau decoys, you right. know, the most common ones. And it would strap on there, and then it had um, the wings, to me, look like um, pedals on a bicycle. They, you know, they would spin. It kind of had them cupped to catch the air, and then they had they had flash to them, you know. I can't remember if he had cupped the entire inside or if it was just the edges, but in high wind, they would spin, and you would get that flash. And he had a video showing... Uh, ducks, you know, he where he was hunting his decoy spread in the wind, and he had the flashers out there, and you would see ducks piling in. But he had not taken it that step further to actually, you know, have the batteries right. that were spinning it. So he had the concept down in 1988. He just hadn't perfected the design, you know, uh, to make it mechanized with a battery to actually turn it. Um, but, man, I remember the first the first time I saw one, um, I hunted with uh, with Charlie Jackson. You remember? Mm-hmm. You remember Charlie? Oh former, yeah, former Arkansas State duck calling champion. That's right. From way back. Way back. Um, uh, his daughter uh, Charlotte won the women's world several times, right. and uh, and actually Tyler Merritt's grandfather. That's yep. Tyler's know, grandfather. Um, the great duck caller, late the late great Tyler Merritt. But um, I just remember I went hunting with Charlie. Steve, this is when I was out of school working in physical therapy, and he invited me to go hunting. I went out to their place, and we were hunting in a field. We were just out in a pit, and it was just one of those days where we didn't have any ducks working close. We just had a lot of high flyers. It was a bluebird day. We could see them high. We called to them. We couldn't break anything down. They were traveling. They were not looking to land anywhere around us, you know, so I don't even know if we fired a shot that morning. It was just bad. And while we were out there, I was uh, I was talking to Charlie and Steve, and I said, you know, I've seen these decoys at these at some of the shows that we go to, like, you know, with the uh, duck calling competitions. We oh, yeah. would go to the outdoor shows. And so I said, I've seen some of these, you know, that were mechanized that had the turning wings on them. And I said, guys, I had someone telling me that those decoys would help break down ducks that were way high like that. It would help you get them in not really realizing yet how effective they were. Right. And Charlie was like, oh, man, it's just a gimmick, you know. And Steve said, you know, I've heard that same thing. I, I want to try one of those. So we just kind of dropped it there. And then later, that it was like the next day, Charlie called me. He's like, what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I got to work tomorrow. He's like, you, you got you to gotta come hunting. I said, man, I've already scheduled patients and stuff, you know, at work. He said, I don't care what you got to do. You you got to you got to get here tomorrow. Because <laughs> he said, you remember that decoy you were telling me about? I said, yeah. He said, oh my gosh, you're not going to believe. You got to get down here and see this. So, I I made a few phone calls, changed my schedule up a little bit, and went hunting, and went out there with that spinning wing decoy, and I was just amazed at seeing the results you know this is before they had years to get used to it so this is the ducks first reaction right to spinning wings and it was just it was incredible you remember like i i have a pretty similar story how i was hunting white river and uh some guys had set up on a point you know a couple two three four hundred yards away from us and we just couldn't figure out them ducks wanted that point They'd check us, and then they'd go straight back to them. Then they would hit them harder, and they'd come back and check us, and they'd go straight back to them. And so we decided to pick up and drive 
you know, just leaving, and they were still hunting. And I said, they got a live duck in the middle of their decoys. Look at that. <laughs> and my buddy Jimmy, he looked at me and he goes, that's a decoy, man. Well, that's what, before the mojos and all these, you know, on the poles and all that, this was a wonder duck, what they called a wonder duck. And the wonder duck sat on the water and had the wings, motorized wings, and it was kicking the water and spinning at the same time. So these, these wonder ducks were swimming. And they turn around at the end of the line and come back. I didn't realize Wonder Duck came out first. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think Wonder Duck was actually out first before the mojo. Yeah, I remember that with the legs moving and everything. They, it was kicking the water. It was yeah. swimming. Uh, you know, and several years ago, I went, I was hunting over at Hurricane. And I went with our buddy Rob Watts. And they they actually this is before then too they actually had what they called a WT. I, when we pulled up in the spot that these guys were hunting, and it was Marty and all of them. Uh, they called it the WT. They called it the water thrower. And they had something similar, but it would shoot water out of its tail end. It had a little tube that come out the tail end, and all of a sudden, you know, it'd kick in and it it'd shoot water out its tail end, and it'd either go under a little bit and swim on or something like that. So even before that Wonder Duck deal, I saw that, and I thought, mm-hmm. man, that, you know, creates a lot of motion. So it, to me, that's kind of where it all started. But then, like I said, the Wonder Duck, when I saw it, I was like, because I don't even think Mojo and all that had, you know, the spinning wing on a pole and all that hadn't even been touched yet. I can't remember what company. I guess the first one I saw, we called it. We just called it Robo Duck. Yeah. I don't remember what company it was, but just the Robo Duck Robo was Duck. the first one that – that I remember, and that's what Charlie had that morning put out there, and I just couldn't believe it. I mean, ducks would <laughs> – I mean, it was just – it was just unreal. I mean, we, la- we were sitting there laughing. I mean, oh, it was yeah. just comical how – and they were they would land right on top of it. They would sit there and hover mm-hmm. with it. With you know? it, yes. Um, you know, it's kind of a joke. Let's be sure we don't shoot the magic decoy there because, right. you know, the, the way they were acting. And The other old joke about having them, you know, because they were like $800 – they got to a point where people were buying them for three or four hundred and selling them for eight hundred because they couldn't keep up couldn't with supply and demand. Yeah. And these guys, <laughs> the joke was even in Stuttgart, you know, people would go in a little chef or whatever and eat, and they'd carry their mojo in with them or Robo <laughs> Duck in with them, but they'd leave her sixteen hundred dollar shotgun sitting in the back of the truck. Yeah, nobody could steal mojo. <laughs> That's right. You they have wouldn't go steal it out of the back of the truck. <laughs> I mean, you know, they'd have two or three of them. You know, but they were on. I remember they started selling online for like eight hundred dollars a piece, <laughs> and I'm like, "Holy! You could buy them for two hundred, three hundred bucks." Yeah. You know when they first came out, it's probably some hunter didn't didn't bust in there with a with a pistol or something, <laughs> and like, all right, hands everybody, hands yeah, up, hands up, know, put the mojo in the bag, nobody gets hurt. You know, it might be something <laughs> like that. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was incredible. And one thing I always remember was how you could be sitting out there just like we are now, just talking. You know, you, we always, you know how it is when you duck hunting. You're always looking at the sky. Right. But it's a social sport. We get to talk. We get to laugh while we're out there. We got our eyes on the skies. We're looking around. But we're getting to talk and, and joke around. How you used to be sitting there talking, and all of a sudden you would just hear the the wind, the duck's wings, you know, that sound, you know, yeah, just cutting wind. the air. Yeah. And you knew that they had seen Mojo from up in the clouds, and they were working their way down. And you didn't have to worry about calling them. I mean, when you right. heard that, you just watched them till they got closer, and you might give them a little confidence call before they hit. A lot of times, you didn't have to do anything. Didn't you have didn't to do even, anything. You didn't touch a call or something like that. But it was, it was incredible to see. One of the first, first times out. I hunted over one, I was on some private ground in a two story blind, and uh, I had one of our uh, baseball coaches from Conway there. We had two widgeon that ended up looking like specks. I mean, just little dots in the sky, you know, because it, it, they were on the path of migration. I mean, they were high. And we just watched these two little specks in the sky. <laughs> just out of nowhere, you could barely see them, and then all of a sudden, and, and they never broke stride. Their wings never rippled back to co- or to to fly or anything it just they peeled them back and they hit they come straight to that robo duck and hit the water right beside it and they were in the clouds when when we first kind of saw something up in the sky that them them two widgeon that was that was the most impressive thing i've ever seen yeah 
Yeah, it is incredible. What the progression though that I saw was after a while, um, it it started getting to where I noticed two things. Number one, it took more than one. Like it started to get into where okay, we got one out. Mm-hmm. Now the ducks are seeing one robo duck in every decoy spread that they fly around, and so. People were having to put out two, three, or sometimes multiple. You know, a lot, lot more of like, not not just two or three, but getting up to really have six, seven mojos going at at one time, right? Um, to make them to distinguish them from the next spread. So I noticed that people were putting out a lot more, and then what I started seeing, I don't know. I would guess. I guess you start detecting a little bit of this even in the second year robo because after that first year, the next season, everybody had one, and they were seeing them all the way from Canada to to Arkansas, you know, on down Louisiana, wherever they everywhere they right. flew, they were going to see robos, and I started noticing that it was still very effective, but you weren't going to get the whole flock in. It was like when you had a big flock working, you know. I still remember these these days of being younger when, you know, it it didn't happen all the time. I don't want to glorify it or make it, you know, overstate from what it was. But being able to put a big wad of ducks into the decoys, you saw it occasionally. You know, you were going to land 50, 100 uh, ducks in your decoys during the season. But we started seeing these bunches come in where you might see, say, 30 ducks, and you think, oh, man, it's fixing to get right down here now. Well, you would always have – a handful of them that would break off, two, three, four, break off and come in and land, and then you still got the bulk of them circling, and you're trying to get them to come in and finish, but you never could finish the whole flock. It seemed like you were always doing a few. Did yeah, you see that? I did see that. Um, going back to trying to be a smart hunter of what they really wanted to see, you know, or just like duck calling, what they wanted to hear, reading the ducks, seeing what they – to your point, just like on the Wonder Duck, we we had some company around us at one time, so we decided to put six Magnum decoys at one end of the hole, and we put eight Wonder Ducks at the other end swimming around, you know, just trying to figure out what they wanted. And fortunate that day it worked out. But every day you had to do something a little different. You know, I've heard people talk about, you need to put them on the edge of that hole in the timber. You know, that's that's what's making them work now. No, you got to get them way out in the woods, and then they're going to come see that spot you're in and the hole in the timber, and then they're going to come in there. And, no, you got to put it in the middle of the hole. It's, mm-hmm. You just keep bouncing them around, and then now you got to add two and three and four and five and ten. You know, there's some guys 15, 20. And, uh, man, I – Just like we're educating these birds is yes. what I always put it to. And I, and I don't know um, – I always – the theory was always, which would make sense, that the young birds, you know, it's kind of like when you would see a few break out of that big flock come down, that those, we were guessing, were younger birds that just hadn't been educated to it yet. Right. You know, your older birds that have had that rear end, pellet, you know, a few pellets in that rear end uh, from time to time, well, they were not going to come down and, and land because they weren't going to finish on that flasher. So... To me, that was one of the big things that I noticed right up, right off the bat was with spinning wings, we were not landing big flocks anymore. So right. Michael, you were seeing a whole lot more of the flocks breaking up and coming down, you know, a few at a time. or uh, You might get two or three, but you're not going to get that whole flock. You know what I figured out, too, uh, myself? You know, hunting the woods on cloudy days, foggy days, it's difficult, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but <laughs> with that robo duck, you can take that robo duck out in the middle of the hole and just put one robo duck up. And if they're low enough in that fog, and they see that flash, uh, they would come. You know, and I'm talking about early on. Yeah. You know, put just put one out. Yeah. You know, so on cloudy days or you know foggy days, typically you wouldn't kill very many ducks in the timber like yeah. that. But with that thing right there, yeah, that it, it could happen. Yeah. Seems like now. I really don't like seeing a spinning wing, you know, when we have hunted with them, they're less effective to me on cloudy days now where they were right. deadly. On they were that, deadly. On that back at then. first when they came out, yeah. Yep, that's right. I mean, it's – they're getting – I mean, 
they're God's creature. They're 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 smart. You know, they're they're very intelligent. You know, they got a little pea brain, but you know, they figure stuff out pretty quick. I've got a pea brain too, but when I get my rear end <laughs> shot at, that's right. You know, I learn quick. You know, oh, yeah. it's like the old saying: "Lessons learned in blood are not soon forgotten." You <laughs> that's know? right. So, you know, so uh, they they catch on to it. You know, um, and you know, uh, Dusty. You know, Dusty out. I mean, being responsible and working, you know, Dusty McDaniel usually with us here on the yeah. podcast. Shout out to Dusty. I hope you enjoy. I think he's going to Milwaukee or something like that a little bit later. But uh, anyway, uh, Dusty had shared an email um, that he had, he had actually sent to the Game and Fish, you know, kind of voicing um, his concerns with the spinning wing. And he, he made a great point that we've all seen is – because of what we were like, what we were just talking about, these ducks not wanting to finish. Right. You know, we see them get attracted in uh, with Robo, and they start working, but we can't really get them. They're they're leery of it, or at least some of the birds in the flock are leery, so they're not wanting to finish on it. He said that he feels like that's promoting what we're seeing on public ground a lot of full chokes and sky busting. Sky ducks, busting. You know, they're yeah. not finishing these birds. They don't feel like they're going to finish. So. When they get them on that lowest pass, what they think is going to be their lowest pass, they're sky busting them, and that just kind of ruins it for everybody. I don't know if you, if if some of the viewers out there, if you've ever hunted in an area where you're competing against other people and you got guys that are just you know blasting them at long distances, lucky to knock one down, it's a that's a frustrating scenario to be hunting in right there. No doubt, and I mean it's happened to me multiple times. You know, get a big group working, get them working swing ducks they're not you know attracted somewhere else and then someone just shoots one time mm-hmm. you know same difference you know for me in, to that point um learning to work them in the you know we're, we're older than than this generation of course but uh, uh, yeah i mean but it, we don't want to talk about we it. don't want to talk about it <laughs> yeah. but i mean learn you know learning how to get them ducks in and work them in um and getting them to finish to me, is 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 the most awesome thing. That's the heart awesome. of it. That is the heart of it. Very, yeah. very heart of it. Yeah, and you um, too with sky blasting, you're you're wounding them. That's you right. Know, you're you're putting a couple pellets in that bird, and you're educating that whole flock. That you whole know, every flock. Every time they get shot at, that's what some we always got to remember when we're hunting that when you squeeze that trigger, you're educating a bird. Mm-hmm. So don't waste that, you know. Um, you know, you get them in for get them in for the kill shots, you know, and don't don't be taking those, you know, sky blast them and stuff like that, you know, where you're you might kill, you're gonna be lucky to kill one, or you're gonna be crippling a lot more. So, you know, it's just a, it's like you're educating them for no reason, right? And, and I think that's one the one thing that you know, especially on public ground, man, when you start educating those birds, it makes it so hard for everybody out there trying to hunt you know most definitely taking those those kind of things so um so anyway i guess our vote is no spinning wings uh public ground we'd like to just keep it banned and you're saying you'd like to just ban them all together that's not on the table with game and fish no that's not on the table um i mean you're giving in to one side versus the other and you know if if you're going to keep them keep them Oh, if you're not, get rid of all. Yeah, you know, in I my, do see in the unfairness opinion. of it. I sure. can see the argument of a public land hunter saying, "Hey, look, you know, you let these guys over here use them and do whatever, but you keep me. You know, you handcuff me on what I can do." So, I can understand that argument. So, yeah, I'm fine with that. If they wanted to ban spinning wings everywhere, I would. I'd be fine with that. I know Jake and I were talking before Jake, and, and does, I think they're both on the same page. Like, no batteries. Uh, Jake says he he didn't want batteries anywhere in his boat. Yeah, other than maybe a flat a rogue flashlight or flashlight, something, which yeah. most of those are rechargeable. But other than <laughs> that, I don't think he wants any any large batteries. Oh goodness, going uh, in the. That's boat. the other thing. I mean, you've just added more to your stash to carry with you. You have, and you got the wings that you want. don't bend the wings, don't warp this, and you how many fit, wings been shot? Yeah, and you can't fit you can't fit everybody in the boat because you got all your electronics in here, you know. So, yeah. talk to your buddy and go find another boat for everybody to ride with him. And what, what fun is it if you can't argue about who's got to 
you know, work the jerk string, you know. Yeah. We all have to be able to elect somebody to pull that jerk string <laughs> to make it harder on them to shoot, you know, to drop the string and uh, be ready to shoulder their gun and yeah. and get yeah. going. So we got to have that designated puller on the uh, on the jerk string. So, but uh, but yeah, man, I I mean, I'm I'm for banning. I think we can we can leave with this. So Arkansas Game and Fish, if you're watching, you know, we said no, so. You don't even have to have a statewide vote. You know, we're against it. And <laughs> we're the only ones that matter. So, uh, and for all you guys out there watching this, man, we'd love to hear your comments on it. Uh, you know, whether you live in Arkansas or not, tell us your, what you think about spinning wings. Uh, if you enjoy hunting with them, if you wish they were banned, um, just uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts and and uh, see what the consensus is on that. But, guys, we're going to be – back doing the podcast next week so uh tune back in with us we're enjoying doing this we're going to start making this a weekly thing so thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week see you next time